Thank you, honorable members. May be seated. Thank you. We will resume from where we left off, and I now give the floor to the Honorable Alvin Maharaj to ask this question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to ask question 103 2017 under my name. The question is directed to Minister for Education, Heritage, and Arts. Can the Minister explain what the Ministry has done to uh, reward schools and teachers for their hard work in producing good results? Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the Honorable Minister for Education, Heritage, and Arts. Uh, Honourable Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for asking this question. <coughs> Madam Speaker, you would, would have noted over the last two years, our teachers and heads of schools have worked extremely hard following the uh, reforms that we implemented. Particularly, Madam Speaker, last year, after Cyclone Winston, our teachers and head teachers, principals, have worked extremely hard to ensure that we finish last year's uh, studies within the last year's academic year. We were worried at some point in time, Madam Speaker, that we might have to spill over this year, given the effect of Cyclone Winston. But together, the management, the heads of schools, teachers, parents, we were able to finish our school calendar year uh, by end of November, and we were able to get the results on time. Madam Speaker, <coughs> we've been thinking of rewarding our heads of schools and teachers uh, for those schools with, with outstanding performance of the last two years. But we thought that we will give time to see the actual output of reforms on performance of students. And we thought that maybe two years with the new reforms would be good. Madam Speaker, I'm happy to um, inform the House today that of, over the last two years we have seen extremely good performance of schools uh, throughout Fiji and we thought that we will reward the heads of schools uh, during the head teachers conference and principals conference. Madam Speaker, for the uh, primary schools we decided to provide awards in two categories. The first category is the overall top schools in the various grades, Madam Speaker, like 6D is the lowest uh, great primary school. Overall meaning, Madam Speaker, taking into account three criteria, percent pass rate, <coughs> number two, uh, number of students in top 10% mark in that particular school, and number three, the students placed <coughs> overall in the national uh, uh, scheme in that particular school, number of the ranking of the students. So that was the first criteria, Madam Speaker. Based on this three uh, methodology, we found out which are the top primary schools in different grades. In the second uh, uh, category of awards, we gave it to schools with 100% pass rate, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in the category one, <coughs> we have got the lowest grade ED6D, ED5C, ED4C, ED3C, ED2C, and ED1B, the largest primary school. Madam Speaker, uh, in, in this category, we provided um, a 3,500 lakh cash to the top performing school, along with a gold star, uh, a star, actual uh, physical star with gold plate, which they would put in front of the school, indicating to everyone, this is a gold star school, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, for ER8 examination, we provided a gold star for the top performing school, along with $4,000 cash, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Madam Speaker, for the second category with 100% pass rate, we had 75 schools, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, you will record at, some, at, at the point in time when we said that let's target 100% pass rate. There were, there were people who were, about, who were quite pessimistic, saying, saying that no, uh, that's an unrealistic target, Madam Speaker. We have got 75 schools, Madam Speaker, out of the 736 primary schools with 100% pass rate, Madam Speaker. So in this category, uh, we provided um, uh, the, uh, the schools uh, the, 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 in, the, in the first category. In ED6D, um, there were 353 schools. The top school for ES6 performance was Sarawa Sanatandaram Primary School, Madam Speaker. 
for the year eight uh, examination result, the top school in Fiji was Langalanga Sanatan Primary School. Madam Speaker, right in Nigeria, in, in Wani Koro, Madam Speaker, they, were, they, were, they are the top school in this country when it comes to performance in year eight examination. In the EDS 5C category, out of 164 schools, Rasa Every Primary School was the most outstanding school for year six result. And for year eight uh, results, Lotoka Zhonghua School, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, for ED 4C category, out of 150 schools, St. Anne's Primary School is the top school in this category for both year six and eight throughout PG, out of the 150. In the EB 3C category, there are 30 schools, and Nandi Airport School is a top school in both the categories ES6 and EI result. For EB 2C, the second largest school, Madam Speaker, 23 schools are there. MGM Primary School is the top school uh, for both ES6 and EI. For the largest school, the EB 1B category, Madam Speaker, the two schools in ES6, Nandi Sangam Primary School, and for year eight, Vito Primary School, Madam Speaker. So Madam Speaker, this is how we rewarded the schools in the head teachers conference. Uh, at times, Madam Speaker, we don't publicly acknowledge the people who, who are outstanding, going out of the way, look, uh, search for solutions outside the textbook to ensure that uh, the uh, you know, vision that we have for education is delivered. Madam Speaker, similarly for high schools, we decided that we will have three categories of award. Category one would be the top performing school. Category two would be the schools who have attained 100% pass rate. And category three are the schools that have excelled in national sporting award events. <coughs> Madam Speaker, in the top performing schools, there are uh, categories based on the si size of school. The ED 4C schools, there are 17 schools. Valempasonga Secondary School was the top school in ED4C category. ED3C category, there are 47 schools. Balata High School is a top school in that particular category, Madam Speaker. The ED2B, 21 schools. Yetsen Secondary School is the top school in that category. ED2D, there are 23 schools. Rakiraki Public School was the top school, Madam Speaker. ED1A, St. Joseph Secondary School, out of the 21 school is a top school, Madam Speaker. ED1C, there are 20 schools, Xavier College in Bar is a top school, Madam Speaker. And ED1D, there are 22 schools in that category, General and College is the top school, Madam Speaker. So you can see, Madam Speaker, these schools were, were given, each school was given $8,000 cash, along with a gold star plate, which they would put in front of the school, indicating to public, this is a gold star school, Madam Speaker. But as bigger, with respect to 100% pass rate, we had for year, year 10 certificate examination, we had Yetsen Secondary School, Madam Speaker, having highest pass rate. Year 12 uh, external examination, Madam Speaker, we had Thomas Baker Secondary School having 100% pass rate, right in the interior, Madam Speaker. And we had Nakawandra High School, again, <coughs> in Rekiriki, 100% pass rate, Madam Speaker. Year 13 examination, we had Nelson College, Thomas Baker, Nandronga Arya, and Balabasonga Secondary School having 100% pass rate, Madam Speaker. Madam uh, Speaker, then we had the, uh, the third category, uh, excellence in school, uh, sporting activities. Madam uh, Speaker, as you know, we, we are placing a lot of embassies. Fiji is a, a sporting nation. Uh, we are supporting uh, all sporting events. And uh, last weekend's uh, event demonstrates the level of uh, talent we have in the country, and uh, no other country has that level of uh, secondary school game organized as we do in, in Fiji, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the under 18, uh, for the under 18 Dean's Rugby, QVS was given the award. For under 19 Rugby, Lalin Memorial School was given the award. For the boys' athletics, athletics competition, Maris Brothers High School was given the award. Girls' athletic competition, Jasper Williams High School was given the award. IDC Soka Nukuloa College, uh, under 19 Netball St. Joseph Secondary School, under 18 Netball Suba Grammar School. Madam Speaker, this is for the, from, for the last year's, last year's uh, games uh, awards, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, uh, this is how we were able to recognize 
incentivize and motivate the schools, heads of schools and teachers and, and, and to say that, look, your hard work is not going unnoticed. We do recognize and uh, it's time that we publicly acknowledge and uh, at the same time, Madam Speaker, we have seen that these awards have motivated other schools saying that next year we would want to come to the stage and receive award. We want our school to be a gold star school, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, uh, we strongly feel that we can motivate the entire education community to uh, uh, be part of the national movement that we have uh, led by Honorable Prime Minister of ensuring that we contribute towards developing a knowledge-based society. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Is it a point of order or supplementary question? Supplementary question. Supplementary question, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Can the Honorable Minister provide data on uh, pass rate in year 2012 and 2013, our external uh, exam for 2016 in relative to 2014? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for asking this question. <coughs> there seems to be all kinds of uh, misinformation floating, floating around mm -hmm. about performance of school vis-a-vis -vis, uh, relative to 2014, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, 2014, year 12 pass rate, we had 45%, 2014. After the implementation of re reform, 2015, year 12 pass rate went up to 60%, and last year, 61%, Madam Speaker. So you can see, Madam Speaker, over a short period of time, we have increased the pass rate for year 12 within the two-year period by about 17%, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Madam Speaker, for year 13, in 2014, we had a pass rate of 37%. 37% pass rate, Madam Speaker, in year 13 for 2014. In 2015, the pass rate went up to 55%. So within one year of reforms, for year 13 examination, a pass rate for pass rate up from 37% to 55%, 2014 to 2015. Last year, Madam Speaker, we had a pass rate of 65%. So Madam Speaker, within two years, we had a pass rate of year 13 increasing from 37% to 65%. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd just like to thank uh, the Honorable Minister for his uh, uh, response regarding uh, the question. He is you mentioned about uh, teachers uh, uh, working extremely hard after Cyclone Winston and the results were on time and then giving out cash grants to schools uh, in big conferences so that they can be uh, very Fiji and see that. But uh, what I would like to ask the Honorable Minister, Madam Speaker, is the teachers make a difference. And are there any plans in 2018 budget to increase teachers' pay? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, our Honourable Minister for Economy has a number of times stated that the salary review exercise for civil servants, including our teachers, is under, at the moment undergoing. A number of times he has said that, and Honourable Minister of Economy has said, well, Honourable Minister of Economy has said that once that is completed, that will be implemented. You can't listen again. Specifically, as you are talking about salary review, salary review, salary review, Minister of Economy has said, Minister of Economy has said, unfortunately, you don't understand about the difference between finance and economy and education. It's beyond you. It's beyond, beyond you. This is the quality of shadow Minister of Econ uh, Education we have. Minister of, Minister of Economy has said, has said that salaries are under review. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister is on record saying that he's not happy with the pass in mathematics. And FTU says it's due to the high um, number of students and few teachers, the, the ratio teachers to uh, students. Can the Minister consider removing the wheat bix and the milk and hire more teachers to teach mathematics? Thank you. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the problem is I had published the full details of class size for national class size, primary, secondary, by year, in papers, and urban, rural, Madam Speaker. 
And if the honorable member read that article published, so at so the national level, our class size is below what we want, below, below the, the maximum we have set. What, 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 wait, wait. You, honorable member, spoke about class size. Let me explain to you about class size, then I'll come to my point. So the problem is that they don't read and get correct information, and they shoot off questions, Madam Speaker. The issue about linking mathematics class size, why only, why mathematics? They don't understand, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, I suggest they do better job before they ask supplementary questions. Don't ask for the shape of it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I just also like to remind honourable members: it's question time. You don't make you don't make proposition. You ask question uh, or clarification of the minister's uh, statement. Thank you. I'd like to give the floor to the uh, honourable leader of opposition. The Honourable Minister, in opening the Fiji Head Teachers Association Conference in Lotok recently, announced that the overall pass rate at year six level was below 50%, and the year eight overall pass rate decreased from 70% in 2015 to 65% in 2016. So my question to the Honourable Minister, whilst congratulating those gold star schools, my question to him is what remedial measures does he have in place to upgrade the standard and performance for the majority of schools which are not gold star in regard to the students and teachers? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Honourable Member. Madam well, Speaker, I want to first thank the Honourable Member for reading that article, that I, my full speech. But unfortunately, she did not read the part in that article where I spoke about strategies that we are using to improve and uplift the performance of uh, poor or low performing schools. One of the strategies, Madam Speaker, I outlined there was that we, lo we launched that day, uh, last week, Thursday, a new package <coughs> to improve literacy and numeracy amongst our children in lower primary schools. Madam Speaker, the foundation is primary school. Foundation for education is primary, primary school. Now, if the foundation is weak, particularly in numeracy and literacy, then it will be difficult for students to perform well in high school because to learn chemistry or physics or biology, you need to have basic literacy as well as numeracy. So we found that weaker area is numeracy and literacy. And therefore, Madam Speaker, we worked very closely with our education partner, the AGAP, part of DFED, to develop a specific strategy which was piloted in 35 schools, Madam Speaker, and then we compared the results in pilot school versus non-pilot school. We found that this new strategy of improving the strategy deals with pedagogy, Madam Speaker. Pedagogy means the knowledge and skills of delivery rather than knowledge about content, subject matter. This pedagogy deals with how you deliver numeracy and literacy, literacy at lower primary, Madam Speaker. So our strategy is to improve literacy and numeracy skills so that we can boost performance in the low performing schools, Madam Speaker. That has been launched. Every school has been given full package of the material along with a DVD showing how teachers are delivered uh, using a new strategy, Madam Speaker. And that hopefully will. Of course, other strategies are motivating teachers, rewarding uh, excellent performing schools, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm only hearing cash rewards. Uh, what about scholarship for teachers in the schools and equipment? Will you also consider that? Uh, Madam Speaker, respect to um, uh, equipment, all those are captured in the grant that we provide. Uh, and in addition, if there is any shortage of equipment, uh, schools do write to us. We look at funding and provide those equipment. So it's a known issue. Actually, it's a known issue. Respect to scholarships, Madam Speaker, there are two ways. One is, uh, you know, uh, they can take leave and, and uh, apply. All of them can apply at TELS and TOPUS to study at uh, the, the local institution. Secondly, Madam Speaker, we also provide in-service awards. If they have done their studies part-time basis, they've got one year left, Madam Speaker. All of them are eligible to undertake full-time study to finish the program on pay, on pay with scholarship. Thank you. Thank you. Again, the Honourable Member made a proposition at that time and not clarification. There being no other supplementary question, um, we will move on to the next item on the agenda, the written question. And I now give the floor to the Honourable Honourable Vande to ask his written question.
Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to us question 104 of 2017 as listed in the order paper today. Thank you. Uh, Minister for Women, Children and Public Innovation. Madam Speaker, I seek a clarification on the question. It's asking for the number of cards issued and the amount distributed per card. Can the honorable member clarify what exactly is looking for? We've issued more than 35,000 cards with information. Honourable member, would you like to clarify? That's all in the question. <laughs> all, all inside the question. <laughs> Amount distributed per card? Oh, if that's what he's looking question. for, Madam Speaker, then I'd like to refer him to Standing Order 44.4, which specifically says these cards are given to individuals. Names of persons are not allowed in question, so it will not be allowed for answers as well. What is he after? It's I can give the number of cards per category of assistance, like how many people for 1,500. I cannot give it per card, 35,000 people. Is the Honourable Minister, would you like to uh, respond to that question in the way you think is best? Speaker. Thank you. Um, and now I um, call on uh, the uh, Honourable Rato Sella to ask his question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, I ask question 105 of 2017 on today's uh, order paper. And the question is directed to the Minister of Employment, Productivity and Industrial Relations. Can the Minister provide A, how many Fijians have been benefited from the seasonal workers program? B, what companies did they work for? C, the demographic breakdown of all the seasonal workers? And lastly, Madam Speaker, D, how much a worker has averagely earned from this program? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Our Minister for Employment, Productivity and Industrial Relations. Madam Speaker, I will table my answer at a later sitting date. It's permitted under Standing Order 45. Thank you. And question time is now over. Secretary General. Ministerial statements. The following ministers have given notice to make ministerial statements under Standing Order 40. One, Minister for Defense and National Security. Two, Minister for Education, Heritage and Arts. Three, Minister for Employment, Productivity and Industrial Relations. And four, Minister for Fisheries. Each minister may speak up to 20 minutes. After each minister, I will then invite the Leader of the Opposition or her designate to speak on the statement for no more than five minutes. There will also be a response from the Leader of the NFP or his designate to also speak for five minutes. There will be no debate. And now call on the Minister for Defence and National Security to deliver his statement. Madam Speaker, the Honourable uh, Prime Minister, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, Honourable uh, Ministers, Honourable Members of Parliament. This morning I would like to make a statement on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, HADR, in Fiji. There is no doubt, Madam Speaker, that this uh, decade is branded and inscribed with increasing frequencies of natural disasters. A year on, after the aftershocks of the severity of uh, tropical cyclone Winston, is still visible. For the Minister of Defense, cyclones like the uh, tropical cyclone Winston, flash floods, looming cyclones, anticipated earthquakes, and strong tidal waves are not only reshaping our topography, they are also remodeling the defense and security landscapes. Madam Speaker, it is for these uh, compelling reasons, underscored by the threats of climate change on human security, that I wish to highlight the emerging importance of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in national security. Madam Speaker, humanitarian assistance is a range of responses or actions in relation to sudden onset emergencies. Emergencies in this regard are times when life-saving priorities come to the fore. 
anticipating environmental emergencies like natural disasters sets the platform for preparedness. For our national security, this preparedness means being ready protect, to protect human life and dignity and strengthening the capacity of the humanitarian community to effectively prepare for and respond to disasters. Madam Speaker, for four to six hours after the tropical cyclone Winston struck Fiji, military personnel responded. Vehicles drove through debris as military engineers began to make preliminary damage assessments. For many, our soldiers sleeping beside rations, walking in disaster torn sites was the norm. Ill-equipped, they marched on. The first international team from Australia and New Zealand, the Defence Forces, uh, responded and arrived into the country within the first uh, 12 hours. Given their geographical pro proximity to the islands of Lao, Tonga sent through a naval boat with rations to Honombalabu. Defence Force assets, including the uh, HMAS uh, Canberra, a landing helicopter dog ship, and the HMNZS uh, Wellington, and HMNZS uh, Canterbury proved to be necessary for surveillance and the delivery of humanitarian aid. International and national HADR medical assistance teams were also deployed to needed areas to provide medical assistance. Medical, uh, med Madam uh, Speaker, soldiers distribute hygiene kits, uh, tapulins, food, seeds, and medical supplies. 700 military personnel were deployed daily. For strategic defense and national security, planners, the realization sunk in that humanitarian action feared for the future is inevitable. Today, the RFMF is embarking on an innovative HADR plan which anticipates risks and challenges. The plan will coordinate and execute HADR activities at the strategic, operational, and technical levels to support national security interests as they pertain to natural disasters. The fundamental shift towards a model of humanitarian action that not only strengthens the response to crisis, but also learns and adapts to the evolving HADR environment is being mapped. The plan put in place by the commander will transform the six FIR to a dynamic team trained above the normal military training to respond during humanitarian crisis and disasters. Basic recruitment has been expanded to include engineering skills for all new recruits. The acquisition of uh, the Bushmaster APCs is an added value to HADR efforts as these uh, vehicles are made for rugged terrains. The expansion of the uh, Black Rock Training Center in Nagi to accommodate increasing peacekeeping and HADR needs is in motion. We know that no other organization has the capability to respond with the speed and effectiveness that the military do in the immediate aftermath of any disaster. As first respondents, the military needs to be equipped and trained to deal with HADR necessities. Similar plans and restructure are currently underway within the Fiji Police Force. HADR responses during flooding in Rakiraki, Bar and the Western Division are testimony of required preparations for our security forces. The ultimate vision is that in the first hours after an environmental emergency, security forces will mobilize trained medical experts, engineers, respondents, and equipment, such as mobile hospitals, mobile des desalination plants, and power tools to the affected areas. Often, HADR teams conduct repeat assessments and analyze the possible impacts on communities and help national authorities develop strategies to respond. To be effective, they need to be equipped. Madam Speaker, the international cooperation focus for defense has integrated HADR. In bilateral and multilateral dialogues, we have explored areas in which assistance and support can be tapped into the complement national initiatives. Similarly, Madam Speaker, Fiji's role in providing humanitarian assistance and disaster relief to the other Pacific Island counties is being carried out, like the Cyclone Pan in Vanuatu 2015. Our soldiers were the first to arrive and do relief work. Despite the relatively positive perceptions on the HADR focus, there are areas we intend to improve, and we are working to prepare ourselves 
to the added responsibilities we are now tasked with. The scale and intensity of disasters requires the combined efforts of civilian and military organizations for effective response. We intend to leverage on the use of technology to enable better information sharing and build closer networks between civil and military players. Partnerships with international and development organizations like the UN OCHA, Red Cross, are critical to knowledge, capacity, and expertise required for the enormous challenges at hand. In conclusion, Madam Speaker, I wish to again acknowledge and express our gratitude to the governments of Australia, New Zealand, France, Tonga, and Papua New Guinea for the speed in which they responded to our ATRDR needs for the deployment of their, of their defence assets. I also like to acknowledge the Minister for Regional Development, his Permanent Secretary and his team for the outstanding coordination role displayed during the rehabilitation phase of the uh, Tropical Cyclone Wilson. There are many partners, uh, Madam Speaker, to thank, and as our security forces engage to execute HEDR plans, we hope the partnerships will be strengthened. Also, I'd like to take this uh, opportunity to acknowledge the Fiji First Government leadership for its uh, vision and direction. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. I now call on the Leader of Opposition or her designate to speak in response. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I rise to respond to the Honorable Minister for Defence uh, on his ministerial statement. Yeah, but we all agree, Madam Speaker, that uh, there is a threat of climate change to human security and that we really need to reshape our topography uh, by remodeling our defence and security landscape. The test of our defence, Madam Speaker, uh, was tested during TC Winston, uh, how we responded uh, how the military had responded to the people, uh, giving them security. Madam Speaker, during the emergency period uh, uh, in, in, in the wake of tropical cyclone Winston, um, it took time, uh, Madam Speaker, for the uh, for security forces to reach our people. Uh, one is the, the clearing of roads to enable them to go to hospitals, to enable them to to go to the, the immediate uh, to get immediate help, Madam Speaker. Uh, while moving around uh, Vonolevo, Madam Speaker, you know, after uh, Winston, uh, Madam Speaker, post Winston, we see that you know rations uh, supplied by the military was quite late. It came, uh, you know, after making the assessments, and some of the assessments, you know, uh, people still waiting for those uh, materials to arrive, and even in some areas, Madam Speaker where rations could not arrive because the infrastructure was really uh, taken out by the speaker. But I agree that uh, we really need to equip our, um, our security forces, especially the military, to be effective uh, in this uh, particular area to respond. And probably the Honorable Minister can also you know, uh, propose an increase in budget reallocation in regards to uh, equipments and even uh, having our own uh, helicopters and even uh, vessels, Madam Speaker, to carry out. We don't have to wait for other military or foreign military uh, personnel, Madam Speaker, to do this for us, given that we are the, the government uh, you know, elected by the people, for the people, and we need to respond in a very uh, timely manner. Madam Speaker, given that, that the Honorable Minister has also talked about uh, in regards to creating uh, committees and agencies, inter-agencies, uh, to communicate. One of the biggest problems is the sharing of information. And uh, we have got this from, uh, you know, the, the Fiji police force and even the military uh, making submissions to various standing committees have identified this particular area that uh, there is security information. The, the agencies do not want to, to share information. And this has become a problem in uh, ministries or agencies in responding where the bureaucracies of uh, the approval system, uh, it um, reduces the, the response time, let me speak. The, the other thing, Madam Speaker, probably the, uh, the, the need for more resources and more training. And I agree that there, there has to be uh, training done to the military to, to respond uh, you know, in a mobile manner, uh, attending to our people in regards to the basic uh, things that they should do when they are encountering uh, uh, disasters, to be more responsive um, uh, to things that they can do without, uh, with the help, Madam Speaker. 
These are some of the issues, Madam Speaker, that probably the, uh, the Honorable Minister can take on board. And the other thing, Madam Speaker, the, the military should also be assigned to mend uh, our evacuation centers, uh, providing food, cooking, and other things, Madam Speaker, and providing basic security where other social problems can happen at uh, various, uh, various uh, evacuation centers. Um, and probably taking them back to, to rebuilding phase on how they rehabilitate more psychological training, Madam Speaker, that needs to be done to those you know, who are disturbed and probably um, the, they are traumatized on this kind of training that needs to be done to our people. And the other thing, Madam Speaker, given that we can learn from what uh, we have um, encountered during TC Winston on how to rebuild. The RFMF also can be tasked, Madam Speaker, to rebuild houses. Uh, we've got the help of home initiative and the cuts and the materials. Some places only nails are arriving, only uh, roofing irons are arriving. You know, uh, people have to pay for carpenters. And probably uh, the RFMF can also be tasked to help our villages in these areas to rebuild the houses using our engineering section at the RFMF. Those are some of the basic things, Madam Speaker, uh, in order to, to improve uh, this particular area and how our people can respond to natural disaster with uh, helping uh, our national security uh, agencies. Thank you. I now call on the um, leader of NFP or his de designate to speak in response. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I thank the Honourable Minister for his uh, statement. I think this is a very important statement uh, that he's made. Uh, partly because, Madam Speaker, uh, I think the, the preparation and the response, uh, the initial response after T.C. Winston was very, very poor. And in fact, you know, it took a while for the government to get uh, things uh, coordinated. And I want to acknowledge here the role that the RFMF played initially uh, together with the support from Australia and New Zealand, as the Minister quite rightly pointed out, arrived within 12 hours. And Mr. Speaker, if that didn't happen, uh, I think we would have uh, very, very serious issues uh, in terms of how we responded immediately. Um, the point that the Minister made uh, with respect to plan, planning, I think is an important one because I don't think that there was a, a proper strategic plan, a tactical plan in place uh, during T.C. Winston where it allowed different government ministries, the RFMF and, and others involved in the relief work to actually quickly respond to all the areas that were affected. And, and I think that is an important step that we need to have a very, uh, uh, very good uh, plan, a strategic plan, uh, a tactical plan so that whenever uh, we have a disaster, that plan, that strategy could be invoked uh, immediately and, and the responses could be rolled on. Uh, the other point that I want to make, Madam Speaker, with respect to the, the, um, the um, disaster and humanitarian relief is that uh, we need to, uh, and, and because we are prone to natural disasters, uh, we need to look at establishing a na national disaster fund. Uh, a rolling fund, a fund which, which uh, has, uh, which is readily available to respond to uh, at any point in time when we have these disasters. And I think it is not an not, uh, unreasonable suggestion. Uh, and, and we can build that fund, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, as, we, as we continue. And uh, over a period of time, you know, there are periods in which we may not need the fund, but we can accumulate, accumulate constantly enough funds in a national disaster fund so that whenever there is one, both the RFMF, the different ministries can have access to that central fund uh, to be able to uh, respond to uh, areas uh, in, in, in the immediate uh, um, uh, time. Because what happened, Madam Speaker, after T.C. Winston, I mean, we, we, if it was not for the general public and other organizations uh, responding in the immediate aftermath of T.C. Winston, uh, we would have uh, some very, very serious implications. So I think the, the idea that the minister has brought about a plan, a strategic plan by the RFMF with, in coordination with other ministries, as well as I would like him to aid and the government to consider this, is a na national disaster fund which can be built on and which is always there for any government to, to source and invoke and, and provide the immediate relief that is necessary, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much.
Thank you. I now call on the Honourable Minister for Education, Heritage and Arts, to deliver his statement. Honourable Madam Speaker, Honourable Prime Minister, Honourable Leader of Opposition, Honourable Members of Parliament. Madam Speaker, the uh, members of the House would be aware that science education has been in the forefront of the national news lately, especially on issues pertaining to declining enrollment numbers in science subjects, especially biology, physics, chemistry at upper secondary levels, and percentage passes that leave a lot to be desired. For this very reason, Madam Speaker, I rise to inform the honourable members of the House, one, the position and robust content of the science curriculum being implemented in our schools. Two, the, the, to point out the varying, various me, uh, varying mechanisms in place to support this curricula. And three, to draft how students' science engagement and proficiencies can be enhanced and enriched through these and other mechanisms, and so reverse the downward trend that science education seems to be heading to. When I speak at the outset, I want to let you know that this is not only a problem in Fiji. It's a problem throughout the world about low uptake of science education by students, Madam Speaker. And we, need, we can't be complacent, Madam Speaker. We need to take lead. Madam Speaker, globally countries are now squarely focused upon exploring and initiating developments and progress based on scientific development. In fact, Madam Speaker, last weekend there was a march throughout America and Australia as well about uh, uh, contributing to more uh, science-based policy making, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the focus has never been greater than in this century, where giant strides has already been achieved worldwide in terms of new discoveries and experiments. With science and technology development, innovation has seen the epitome of human invention. A lot of human contemporary issues, or even threatening complications from the past, are now eliminated through science and technological innovation, Madam Speaker. Serious threats to humans in the form of land, air, space, food, water, luxury are now removed with new developments. Just last month, Madam Speaker, UNESCO facilitated a meeting of education ministers of the Pacific region in Samoa to discuss science and technology policy making in the Pacific, which signifies the new, now new movement towards science education in the region, Madam Speaker. Everyone now, Madam Speaker, is now getting to understand the importance of science-based policy making, or policy making based on scientific methodology. But to do that, Madam Speaker, we need to have science knowledge. Madam Speaker, the National Science Curriculum emulates this concept of building on prior knowledge of students, and this is seen in progression of knowledge being introduced from early childhood to year 18, Madam Speaker. In these valuable moments, I wish to help the honorable members realize that this progression of de delivering rigorous inquiry-based teaching and learning will set our young people on the path to becoming the next generation of scientists, engineers, and medics. Madam Speaker, in view of Fiji being signatory to the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development, it is well fitting that sustainability is a cross-cutting theme in science curricula to ensure its longevity and it being a driving force to shape and set our young scientists on their way to scientific prospect. And for many young people, interest and accomplishments in science will turn out to fuel and propel their overall commitment and consequent success in school. Madam Speaker, I'm unable to emphasize enough the importance of science education. Indeed, I echo the sentiments of the Scientific Advisory Board of the United Nations Secretary General that, and I quote, science is fundamental in meeting the challenges for sustainable development as it provides the foundations for exploring new approaches and technologies to identify, clarify, and tackle local, regional, and global challenges. Science is include, inclusive in that it segregates no one regardless of race, creed, or location is the medium by which all people link to the environment and to activities in their daily lives. It is cross-cutting in nature and may be found in arts, other subject areas, developed literacy, numeracy, and technical skills, unquote. However, Madam Speaker, as I alluded to earlier, the interest of seemingly lack of it in schools, as evidenced by the declining science enrollments 
and underperformance in the exter external examinations is a cause of concern for teachers, educators, stakeholders, partners, and tertiary institutions, <coughs> and indeed the wider business and risk of course. To the extent, Madam Speaker, I had a meeting with recently from the Dean of the Science of University of South Pacific, raising her concern about lower, declining number of students coming to the college, to the faculty in USP, and Madam Speaker, and her willingness to support us in motivating students to uptake science education after year 10. Undeniably, the statistics paint a downward movement trend for science education and the future of science in the nation. Enrollment statistics in 2017 all show a decrease from 2016 in biology, chemistry, physics. And as speaker, if you look at uh, year, year 11 uh, biology, in 2015 we had 4,421 students. 2016 went down to 3,984 students. This year, further down to 3,021 students. Chemistry, year 11, 2015, 4,457 students. This year, down to 3,019 students. So similarly, Madam Speaker, to look at year 13, biology, uh, 2015, 2,736 students, down to 2,228 students this year. Chemistry in 2015, 2,936 students down to 2,234 students. Physics in 2015, 2,051 students down to uh, 1,269 students. Madam Speaker, if this trend continues, then in another 10 to 15 years' time, we'll have difficulty in having adequate number of science teachers, difficulty in having nurses and doctors, etc. in PT, Madam Speaker. The situation is really big in some other Pacific Island countries. For example, in martial arts, when I speak up, that only 12% of the teachers are qualified in the subject area to teach. This is the level of shortage of teachers they have, when I speak up. But we are not in that situation now, when I speak up, but we can't be sitting and be complacent about, but we need to arrest this problem, when I speak up. When I speak up, the preconceived ideas that science subjects are difficult, that there is a lack of career opportunities in science field in Fiji and the region, Parents pressurizing the children to adapt career choices that are more readily available and less complicated to attain, and simply because of the low interest level of students into science from an early age, are some of the main contributing factors to this kind of thing. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, there is this notion amongst children in early, early years of high school or later part of primary school that science is difficult, Madam Speaker. And this is one of the major problems that we need to break through the mindset of children that it is not really difficult, Madam Speaker, and that there are opportunities out there in science, huge opportunities out there in China in terms of employment, labor market, as well as, Madam Speaker, pay structures. Madam Speaker, and this has contributed to poor performance uh, also in, in science subjects because, you know, those students who have entered science, kind of they have this preconceived idea that chemistry is difficult, uh, physics is difficult, biology is difficult, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, some of the effects of lack of science development in any nation are the poor ability to deal with contemporary problems in certain areas. While other global nations are tackling national issues and constraints to development of science, Pacific Island states are lagging behind many fronts, Madam Speaker. Inventions all over the world in areas of health, food production, safety, business, production, productivity, and human welfare has made tremendous strides. This then permeates into policy making, but it's less scientific, legal, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, if you want, uh, to undertake solid policy making. The policy making should be based on scientific rigor and therefore of solid scientific content, Madam the Speaker. There are also difficult protocols for scientific advice during emergencies. This could be in the areas of reliable communication technologies, disaster management, food storage and preservation, water purification, desalinization, water testing, personal hygiene, waste disposal, etc. There are lack of scientific expertise for EIEs, Madam Speaker, environmental monitoring and rehabilitation, lack of scientific capacity to deal with environmental disasters, chemical spills, shipwrecks, etc., droughts, infrastructure development, maintenance. Often, Madam Speaker, we hear from business sector saying that we don't have this kind of expertise, technical know-how in Fiji. And this is not only peculiar to Fiji, but the entire Pacific region, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, with climate change, global warming, and sea level rise at our doorstep and threatening to vastly change the routine of life in the Pacific, the rise to other very difficult is evident, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Education, Henry Nart, takes a very serious approach. 
to these figures and with the strongest possible and gravest intent, I aim to turn these statistics around by changing mindsets and strengthening science standards and curricula and assessment and providing opportunities that expand science time beyond the classroom test, making connections to real life and assisting students in thinking about potential careers in science and ultimately their future. Let me briefly review for the floor how science education curriculum works with Madam Speaker before I get into some of the strategies that we have adapted explicitly to raise students' interest in, in science education. Madam Speaker, a child entering any early childhood education center around the country will encounter science in the form of play, information regarding the feel of environment and the sound, smells and sights around them are related to play. Discovery and investigations are the way to learn for kindergarten students. As a child progresses to year one to three, the curriculum focuses on familiar themes and allows the child to draw from their own context, thus making learning responsive and relevant to the learners. The new syllabus continues to enhance interaction and the development of many skill sets. Learning at this level of early primary, when a speaker is child-centered and inquiry-based. The basic science principles for learning strengths of living things and environment, matter, energy, earth and beyond at year four. And these trends are developed through to year 10. In the higher primary, the key learning areas of the curriculum now challenges and empower students to use scientific processes to develop an understanding and appreciation of physical and natural systems and apply their knowledge, skills, and attitudes to enable understanding and make sound judgments. Madam Speaker, basic science is compulsory to all students entering secondary school at year nine. When students reach lower secondary, their skills, knowledge, and attitudes are further enhanced with new concepts. Madam Speaker, there is more. The new practical components of science that complements the teaching of concepts in classroom and engages students to develop an important skills, enhance the appreciation of scientific investigation, and further develops the understanding of the science concepts. For what is science without practical and experience? Madam Speaker, we have also distributed um, science kits uh, to primary schools so that we raise among students the interest in science at the primary school level, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we have also developed external partnerships through stakeholders and organized competitions and national activities. Students have the opportunity to explore beyond the classroom at many levels and are many times rewarded handsomely for themselves in the schools. Further, these activities are a bigger classroom participating students are part of a national and international conferences of national and global initiatives such as renewable energy or ocean anti-pollution or World Water Day celebrations, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, two weeks ago, our Ministry of Education, Heritage and Arts launched the first ever National Science and Technology Competition 2017, targeting year nine students only, Madam Speaker because this is the crucial year where the students make a decision whether they want to branch out, branch out into science or commerce and arts, Madam Speaker. So this national competition in science and technology that we have launched, Madam Speaker, is for year nine students, Madam Speaker. The competition is aimed at generating and creating interest and enthusiasm and bringing attention to the many captivating and fascinating fields of science, Madam Speaker, that students can explore and eventually make a very rewarding career out of, Madam Speaker. So, all in all, Madam Speaker, it's about raising their interest, arousing competences, giving them information that opportunities exist, all kinds of opportunities exist, Madam Speaker, and how science has become now in the forefront of policy making, Speaker. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, there are nine sub-themes being explored in the competition. These are climate change, renewable energy and recycling, food security, transportation, health and personal safety, biodiversity and conservation, environmental issues and sustainability, risk reduction, and management and entrepreneurship. There are four categories of competition, Madam Speaker, and this include one, poster competition. This will be individual student work with each school submitting their best entry for the divisional level judgment. Second, model competition. Students may work in groups of three to four with each school submitting their best entry for the divisional level judging. Three, scientific investigation and report competition. Students may work in groups of three to four with each school submitting their best entry for the divisional level judging. And four, team 
quiz competition, each school will field one team consisting of four students participating at the divisional level competition. The competitions will be judged at the divisional level, central, western, northern, and eastern. Five winners will be declared for each competition in each division, and prizes will be awarded to winners at the divisional level. From divisional winners, one overall national winner will be selected for each competition and awarded as well. With these school-based competitions now being rolled out in all secondary schools at year nine, we are factoring the development of a renewed interest for future science movement in students. Madam Speaker, textbook and other resources, including teacher guides and handbooks, supporting support teaching and learning by putting into students and a compact but comprehensive package of all basic concepts in the key respective learning areas. Both students and teachers are encouraged to further research into this concept during teaching time. Aligned to syllabi, the contextualized for students to make content and scope of syllabus easier to follow. These resources are provided free to charge each child. Further, all documents pertaining to external examinations for all science examinations include marking schemes and examiner's reports are made available on Ministry of Education and the NARTS website to assist teachers and students in teaching and learning during revision. The Madam Speaker, in light of having um, graduate teachers with mismatched subject combinations, the Ministry of Education made several strong recommendations to tertiary institutions to ensure that they offer appropriate subject combinations in the teaching teacher training program said that we have um, a good set of teachers in our schools. Madam Speaker, we have also um, have um, increased allocations for top of scholarship uh, for science areas. In agriculture, we had uh, in 2014 six students. Now we have about 11 uh, or 12 teaching every year. Bachelor of Engineering, in 2014, we had only 35 students. Now, uh, this year, we offered 60 uh, scholarships. Uh, certificate point aircraft maintenance. In 2014, we had only two students. Now we have about eight students every year. In the medical program, initially we had about 161 students in 2014. Uh, this year we had 189 students taking medical uh, program top of scholarship. In the uh, computing side, Bachelor of Nascent in Computing, we had one in 2014. Now we have about 19 students, uh, new students. Uh, BSc, we had seven uh, before. Uh, last year, we had 23, and we have six more this year, Madam Speaker. Software engineering, we had 14 in 2014. Uh, we have now have 25 new this year. Uh, BSc, GCED, 17. Uh, we have uh, another 15 uh, this year. So, all in all, Madam Speaker, we, have, we are seeing a gradually a increase in the science area. Uh, we are uh, in, in terms of our allocation for toppers, and this will motivate more students to um, choose science as an option uh, after year 10. So, Madam Speaker, starting this year, uh, we are uh, preparing for more uh, support to our schools uh, and students who want to take science as an option, but I think we need a national movement that will um, raise the importance of science education and how opportunities are there for students who take science as an educational option in their high school system. Thank you. Thank you. And now, call on the Leader of Opposition who does he need to speak in response. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honorable Minister for Education for delivering his ministerial statement on strengthening science education in schools. But one of the limiting factors, Madam Speaker, for teaching science subjects in school is the non-availability of uh, even the most basic equipment for use in demonstration and laboratory exercises. Science classes are more interesting to students, Madam Speaker, when it comes to the practical part and having the proper resources and equipment for carrying out practical classes, which makes these classes even more interesting. Madam Speaker, when students are interested in the lesson, they they will also be more eager to learn. Therefore, Madam Speaker, I urge the Honorable Minister for Education to ensure that all schools in the future are equipped with the necessary equipment and resources in order to carry out the practical classes and give an opportunity to learn it to, to all students who are taking science classes. A major drawback, Madam Speaker, is the high cost of equipment and chemicals, and the Ministry should uh, monitor the prices in markets. Madam Speaker, what I'm saying here is that most students who take science classes are not 
doing well because the school does not provide the, the proper equipment and resources to enhance learning. In some schools, the students are sharing equipment, Madam Speaker, or even go through a demonstration in class due to lack of uh, resources. Some schools, Madam Speaker, in lack, even lack school laboratories and conduct science classes in classrooms. Also, Madam Speaker, there must be alternative. Also, Madam Speaker, there must be a clear pathway in the curriculum from primary to secondary to tertiary institutions and to the world of work. Secondly, Madam Speaker, if the Honorable Minister of Education is more serious with improving science classes and subjects in schools, then specialized teachers, as I already had mentioned, must be given scholarship to pursue further training in this area in the uh, area of uh, science. Some teachers who are taking classes, science classes, Madam Speaker, in schools are unqualified, lacking the knowledge and skills because they are not given the opportunity to pursue further studies in tertiary institutions. Madam Speaker, it is also important for the Honorable Minister and his ministry to align the primary school curriculum as well in this area of learning, thus providing the equipment and resources and qualified teachers, as I have mentioned earlier. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Minister has promised in his maiden speech in this house earlier this, that he will call for an education summit to provide wider consultation with these education stakeholders who also have better ideas on the way forward in science education. This year is not done. I therefore call on the Minister of Education to consult unions, Madam Speaker, uh, universities, NGOs, principals, and teachers' association, and school management in this regard, rather, rather than dictating what needs to be done, especially when it is on unfamiliar grounds. <laughs> Madam Speaker, to brand all schools in the, in, in, for a declining trend is just an assumption. Some students in schools do extremely well in this area, and they can be used by the Honorable Minister to highlight their success for other students to emulate. And Madam Speaker, Band-Aid solution is the hallmark of the current minister. Long-lasting solutions are important if the ministry wants to be successful in this area, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. It's time for me to sit down, so I will sit down. I now call upon the leader of the NFP, who is designated to speak in response. Thank you, uh, uh, Speaker. Uh, I just want to uh, quote uh, one of Fiji's uh, foremost uh, attorneys um, who was speaking at, who was speaking at the uh, Fiji Institute of Accountant Congress, Richard Naidu. Uh, and, he, and, he, and, he said, and he said the following, Madam Speaker, about education. It has no vision, no plan, no cons consultation, no objective measure of quality. Now what, 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 what the Honorable Minister has done today, Madam Speaker, he, you know, he chose a very important subject, and I agree that the uh, decline in science education needs to be addressed, it's important. But what he's done, as he's done in the past as well, he's, he's, tinkered, he's been tinkering around the whole curriculum, the education system. He's, he's basically he's scattered around the issues. And, and you do not do that when you want to change educational curriculum, Madam Speaker, and this is why I, I keep emphasizing, I keep emphasizing a need for a education commission. We need to review, we need to understand why some of these things are happening. And, and all, all we are seeing is stopgap measure, temporary measure uh, in, in addressing issues as it comes. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, Madam Speaker, science education, I came through a science background. All of us in the 70s, 80s, you know, right up to Form 6, is to do science. And after doing science, you know, we would branch in. You know, when we came to the University of the South Pacific, we did foundational solar science. We used to do, we, we did other subjects as well. And somebody like me, who, who never did economics in high school, actually ended up doing economics at the university. So the, the real uh, reason behind why the numbers have declined uh, is, not, is not coming out clearly from the minister. He needs to look at 
what is the pathway, what is happening at the, at the primary school level, what is happening at the secondary school level. Students know that there are issues about getting science education, getting science degrees, and then getting employment and getting into uh, appropriate areas for, for their future. So they know that when they get into year 12 or year 13, where they have a choice to go into a science stream or a social science stream, they obviously choose accounting, economics, and, and, and more than that, Madam Speaker, while we are concerned about the decline in science education, we should also be concerned about the decline in social science education, in history, politics. Students are not going into those subject areas in the universities as well. So I think what we need to do, Madam Speaker, is to understand what are the real reasons why this, is, this trend is there. And, and I, don't think, I don't think that the minister actually understands, understands what has happened. All he does, you know, if somebody says science numbers are going down, then he says, all right, we're going to go to the school, provide them this. He's not coming out. He doesn't know. The Ministry of Education doesn't understand the reasons behind why there is a decline. And unless, unless they have an exp I mean, I'll give you an example. He's, he's not worried about what's happening even in the universities. I haven't seen the minister talk about universities are running courses in cookery when they should be concentrating on, on, on science degrees, providing the support, providing the strategies to link link the universities to what's happening in the high school, what's happening in the primary school. This is where he needs to concentrate. And he cannot come up with a better strategy to enhance that manner speaker unless we ourselves, we ourselves in this parliament understand what is happening. And we need some expert advice, and minister needs expert advice. He's not an expert in education, Madam Speaker. I've got one more minute. He's not an expert in education. So I would, I would encourage the Prime Minister, I would encourage the Prime Minister to, to take, take, take this, uh, take, show some leadership and, and have an education commission appointed, Madam Speaker, to understand what's happening right from preschool to the university level. Otherwise, otherwise we are getting into some serious quality issues and a decline in the level of skills that we're going to have in this country in the future. And it is not too late, Madam Speaker, for me to call on the Prime Minister to instruct the Minister for Education to appoint the Education Commission so that we understand what is going on in this country in the education system. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Members. At this point, we will suspend the proceedings for lunch. Please note that uh, lunch is provided for Honourable Members in the big committee room. Honourable Members of the Business Committee are reminded of our meeting in the small committee room. Parliament will resume proceedings at 2.30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Members.